I want to say hello and welcome, and I especially uh, want to say a special welcome to those who are watching this via video uh, at our Allison campus. Hello to all of you. Um, we have been journeying along in this message series called Five Easy Steps to Wreck Your Life, and I just want to uh, point you out to your program where there is an outline that you can follow along if you wish as well. Um, we want to also acknowledge uh, LifeChurch.tv uh, who have provided the resources and the idea behind this sermon series. It's been really very interesting as we've been moving along. Now today we're going to focus on how to be dissatisfied. And I've got to say, it hasn't been hard researching for this one. This one I could, yeah, I could very easily find that. In fact, I can point back to a story um, in my, from my childhood back in, oh, I'm going to say 1977-ish. I don't want to give away my age too much, but uh, pre-teenager, it was Christmas, and I had asked for a Spanish classical guitar. Okay, not, not a, a wiry, you know, whiny, shiny guitar. I was a Leona Boyd fan. And you see, I wanted to learn how to pluck those nylon strings like Leona Boyd. And uh, that's what I wanted for Christmas. Well, I woke up Christmas morning and ran to look underneath the tree. There was a box that was suspiciously shaped and sized that would look like a guitar. I ripped open the wrapping and I opened the lid carefully just like someone who, oh I don't know, had found a treasure chest and wanted to see what was inside. So I opened that lid and there it was. A wired string acoustic guitar. It was not what I wanted. The shiny, tinny wire strings were staring up at me, and this was not what I asked for. And I'm afraid of my preteen angst, I was not able to hide my disappointment. Oh no, well, I probably wouldn't have been able to hide it today either. I, I tend to, yeah, wear my, <laughs> thank you, yes. Anyway, how could this happen? How could they have gotten this wrong? I was very clear that I wanted a Spanish classical guitar. Well, needless to say, my mother ran from the room in tears. Everyone glared at me with disdain. And to this day, this event has gone down in my family history as the guitar Christmas. My siblings love to bring this up regularly to remind me, yes. But why am I telling you this story? Well, because it highlights the point that unless I had gotten that specific guitar, I was not going to be happy. I was not going to be content. I was very dissatisfied. Now, I'd like everybody here and everybody at the Allison campus, I'd like you to raise your hand if you agree that money and things do not buy happiness. Raise your hands. Do you agree that money and things do not by happiness. That's great. I'm sure most hands, hopefully, are up at the Allison campus. So then you would agree with the scripture reference um, from 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 8, where Paul was telling Timothy, he said, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Wow, godliness with contentment is great gain. And I love this next part. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. You know, over the course of my uh, pastoral leadership career, I've done several funerals and I have never seen a U-Haul hooked up to the back of a hearse yet. We have brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But then it goes on and says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Wow, there's the basics for contentment, food and clothing. And I will wager, no, I won't wager because I'm a pastor, I can't bet. Okay, I will, no, I will um, expect that most people here have had some food within the last 24 hours. You've, you've hopefully had a meal, maybe more than one, likely. Um, for some of us, we've had more than one. And um, I would also guess, as I look around, that everybody has clothing. And for this, I'm very grateful. <laughs> very grateful, and I bet you are too, especially with the minus 30 wind chill. 
living in where we live. So everybody has clothing on. So scripture says if we have food and clothing, we should be content with that. But the reality is, and I think you would agree with me, most people are not content with that. We always want just that little bit more. Now, let me ask you another question. How many of you, and at the Allison campus, I want you to answer as well, how many of you honest, honestly believe that if you just had a little bit more money, it would make your life a little better? Now raise your hands. If you just had a little bit more money, life would be just a little bit better. That's hard to do in a public forum, isn't it? Especially after we've just said that money and, uh, you know, things can't, buy us happiness. So I think that intellectually, we can say that money and things don't buy happiness for most of us, but the way we live is actually communicating something very different, that deep down, we really believe that if we just had something else, then life would be good and, and we would be satisfied. Are you with me? Say yes, say yes at the Allison campus. Yes? Okay, excellent. Well, I guess Gallup um, did a poll uh, to find out how much people thought they would need, how much money they would need in order to be happy. And here's what they found out. Very interesting. They polled people who made under $30,000 a year, and they said, how much do you think you would need in order to be satisfied? And they said, well, you know, if we could make $74,000 a year, then we would be satisfied. And I'm thinking, where did they come up with 74000 But anyway, that's what the poll says, so I'm just reporting the poll figures. Now, now, then they asked the people who made around $50,000 a year, and they said, so how much would you need in order to be happy? What would you need to make? The average response was $100,000 a year. So we've gone from fifty dollars to $100,000. I think there's a trend here. Um, and yet those who make $100,000, and I'm purely speculating here, I can imagine that with a mortgage payment and car payments and maybe a couple of kids in university, even that may not be enough. You know, I'm just thinking that uh, they'd be saying, I've got news for you, it doesn't go as far as you think. So, in reality, most people, if they were truly honest, when you ask them what they need to be happy, they would say, well, just a little bit more, just a little bit, just a little bit. Well, Jesus told a parable that ties into this, and it's found in Luke 12, starting in verse 16, and you can follow along in the outline, or if you have your Bibles with you, you can open up to that. So here's what Jesus said. He said this, the ground of a certain man produced a good crop, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. But then he said, this is what I do. I will tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, hey, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. Which, in reality, isn't it? That's what most of us want to be able to do, right? We want to be able to say, hey, you know, we'll store up our stuff so that we can relax and say, hey, eat, drink, and be merry. We say, one day when we get to such and such, then we will be happy. And there's so many things that we can be dissatisfied in. We've already talked about money. We can say, and our poll showed that, that the majority of people um, just are not dissatisfied with the amount of money they have. We can be dissatisfied with our bodies. Oh, if I only lost, could just lose 20 pounds, you know, or 40 pounds, or 60 pounds. Um, we're dissatisfied with our relationships. One day, when I get married, oh, then I'll be happy, say some single people. You know, just, I'll be happy once I get married. Or, how about the married people? Gee, I was, wish I was married to a better person. <laughs> I thought one day when I was married that I'd be happy, but now I'm married to him, and he's just not what I thought. You know, we can be dissatisfied in our relationships. Or, how about this one? I was happy with my iPhone 4, true, true. <laughs> then iPhone 5 came out. <laughs> How about the new BlackBerry, the BB10 that's coming out? I mean, you know, we just uh, want the next thing. Or we say, one day when I get there, then I'll take life easy, just as in this parable. I'm not satisfied yet, but one day, then I'll be happy. And here's what God says in verse 20 of this parable. He says, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. And this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, 
but is not rich toward God. So here's what I want us to do today. I want to talk to you very directly about how to be dissatisfied. If you ever find yourself ever becoming content or thankful to God about anything, oh, now listen, we've got to stop that. I want you to follow these five simple steps on a guaranteed life of dissatisfaction. So are you all ready? Say yes. Here we go. Are you ready at the Allison campus? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so the first step in becoming dissatisfied is become great at being ungrateful, okay? And it says here in Hebrews 12, 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe. Now, here's how you can become great at being ungrateful. For those of you who are followers of Christ, you know that you are joint heirs with Christ and that you're going to inherit the kingdom of God. And you're going to have mansions in heaven. And oh, what about those heavenly bodies? Yes, this is all a good thing. But no, 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 no. I don't want you to think about that right now. I don't want you to think about that at all. It's not important. What is important is right now. Now, eternity is not important. What is important is here and now. And although God may have given you a lot of things, there's still a lot of things that you do not have. And you want to make sure that you yearn for those things. I want you to focus on those things that you don't have to develop the full spirit of ungratefulness. Now, here's what you do. What you can do to resent God's goodness, uh, you have to resent God's goodness in other people's lives. Every time God blesses someone else, say, why didn't he bless me too? I wish that was me. And then make sure you ignore God's goodness in your own life. Sure fire way to be dissatisfied. Now, never be thankful that you've got good health. Never be thankful that your kids are doing well. Never be thankful that you own a vehicle, which puts you, by the way, in the top 3% of the wealthiest people in the world. Be like the nine lepers. Remember there were 10 lepers that Jesus healed? Be like the nine don't go back and thank him. Only one thanked him. Don't, don't do that. Be like the nine lepers. And you will be on your way to being great at being ungrateful. Number two, compare what you have to people who have more. Oh, I love doing this. Um, 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves. Are you still with me? Themselves? Great. They are not wise. Well, they may not be wise, but we do need to know what our ranking is in life after all because you have to compare to know where you, you know, sort of lie on the food chain here. If you want to be really dissatisfied with your life, be sure to compare what you have with those who have more. Make sure you drive through the neighborhoods where the homes are more beautiful than yours. In fact, open up your Saturday paper to the piece that features the home of the week. Oh, I did that today. It did the trick for me. Wonderful. These homes are more beautiful than mine. Wish you had a house like that. And then go back to your little shack. I call it a Barbie house because it's never big enough. And uh, yeah, feel really dissatisfied. Whenever you start to be satisfied with something, find someone who has something better or more. Husbands, compare other people's wives. Wives, compare other people's husbands. Ladies, compare your bodies to the magazines on the checkout state. I just love going to the superstore and looking at those magazines. Lovely, lovely, loving. Compare yourself to those. Hey, men, if you don't have any hair, compare yourself to a man who does. And just, you know, uh, make sure that you're not, not satisfied. Compare who has the most friends on Facebook. Compare who has the most songs on their iTunes. Compare salaries. Find someone who does less than you but gets paid more. Oh, that works for me. Oh, yeah, that's a real good one for me. Um, and that gives you a good spirit of ungratefulness. Whatever you do, don't sign up to go on a short-term mission team, especially to Rwanda or a developing country, because you'll come back feeling fa thankful and grateful for what you have. So don't do that. Absolutely not. Number three, are you still with me? Yes, perfect. 
Pursue temporary possessions over eternal treasures. Oh, this is delightful. Luke 12, 15. Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Oh, we know that's not true. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Everyone knows your life is your possessions. In fact, we seek to try to get all the possessions we can because we want to feel like, you know, uh, that creates our identity as someone who's important. Your life is isn't relationships. Your life isn't things that are going to last. It's all about the temporary. More is better. Bigger, bigger, better, better, best, best. That's the goal in our consumeristic society. Make sure you invest your time and energy in the pursuit of temporary things. Oh, you'll have to work more hours. You'll have to miss out on the, the baby's first steps, but oh, you are in pursuit of the temporary. Uh, never eternal treasures. Number four, Resent God for where you are in life. Psalm 43, 2 says, You are God, my stronghold. We, why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? If you want to be resentful and really dissatisfied, then resent where God uh, has placed you in your life. Resent where you are in your life today. Say, God, it's all your fault. If you were who you really said you are, then I wouldn't be in this situation right now. I wouldn't be in this place. God, I'm angry with you because I'm not married. God, I'm angry with you that I did life the way I was supposed to, and now I'm in this marriage that's no good. God, I'm angry with you that I have been giving faithfully and serving, and yet so-and-so is more materially blessed than I am. God, I'm angry at you that I'm not where I thought I should be in life. God, if you were really who you said you were, then I would be more where I wanted to be. You want to be dissatisfied? Resent God that you aren't where you thought you should be in life. Real easy thing to do and guarantees dissatisfaction. And finally, number five, develop an attitude of entitlement. <laughs> Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. The truth is what you and I deserve is death. We've done wrong in the eyes of a holy God and you and I really don't deserve anything when you get right down to the basics, when you peel it all away. But just ignore that. In order to be really dissatisfied, you always need to feel like you deserve more. You've had a rough life. You've worked hard. You've got it coming to you. You deserve it. You deserve those new shoes. You deserve that new outfit. You deserve that new gaming system. What about that car? Hey, you deserve it. Don't, don't let anybody talk you out of it. And even if you can't afford it, get it anyway. You deserve it. Okay, we're just going to take a pause for a second. You know how hard it is to preach like that? <laughs> And if you're new here today, or if you're new at the Allison campus, really and truly, we don't want you to wreck your life. <laughs> we really don't. That's not the goal. This way that we've been presenting these ideas is shocking. It's, been, it's a satirical approach. We've been sarcastic on purpose. And we've been saying the opposite because, of course, these are really warnings. These are warnings to all of us. We don't want anyone wrecking their life. And what we've been talking about are the common causes of lives that, yeah, common causes of what wrecks our lives. Because we need to be reminded constantly. And you know, I can forget this easily. We do have a spiritual enemy, and his name is Satan. And his goal is to steal, to kill, and to destroy anything that is good in our lives. That's his goal. And he uses these strategies, and we can fall into them if we're not paying attention. And that's what this has all been about. We can find ourselves falling into these messes and wrecking our lives. But here's the heart of it. And the whole key to this series can be summed up like this. How we live reveals what we really believe. Can you say that with me? How we live reveals what we really believe. And I hope you said that with me at the Allison campus as well. And if we're honest, 
The way that we're living is this. We're saying this. What Christ offers is not as good as what the world offers. What Christ offers is not as good as what the world offers. Whew. Whew. Let's just go back to the first of the series. What was the first message? It was on how to commit adultery. We say, well, God, I, I promised for better or for worse, and now it's been eight years later or 12 years later or 50 years later. I don't believe that what I promised to you is as good as that other person out there, and what you offer is not as good as something else. Or week two, how to drift from God. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did the God thing. I prayed the prayer. But now I'm going to put them on the shelf because you know what? There are so many distractions and such lovely, shiny things in the world. Um, you know, I think I'd rather pursue those things. I'm just going to drift along and drift away from you, God, because what you offer isn't as good as the world. Now, how about last week? How to be addicted? Well, we say, I know God is life and freedom and joy, but what I need is peace and comfort. And I can find those while I look at those pictures on the internet and those websites, or I can find comfort and peace in this bottle much easier. You know, I need peace and I need something else to give me what I'm missing because Christ is not enough. God is not enough. Really, all these messages have been landing at this one spot. They've been leading to this one place that we can trace most of these situations to. There's the belief that what Christ offers is not good enough. And it's not as good as what the world offers. That Jesus isn't enough. So I want to bring uh, this message to a close by reading a passage in Scripture. Uh, Philippians 3, 7 to 8. Here... Um, the Apostle Paul, who's in prison, he has every reason to be self-satisfied. He has every reason to put confidence in himself. He's got all the badges of his Jewish heritage. Hey, 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 he's an Israelite by birth. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. And oh, I've learned that that's a very special tribe. A Hebrew of Hebrews. But you know what? He knew. He came to a place where he knew that that was not enough. Paul's encounter with the living Christ meant that nothing he received by way of heritage or anything that he did by way of human effort could be the means of a satisfied life, let alone the grounds uh, for righteousness, for being righteous before a holy God. He discovered, and this is a big thing, and this is what we want to all discover he discovered that it was only through the redeeming significance of Christ's death and resurrection that could become enough for him. Let's take a look at Philippians 3, 7, 8. Paul's looking back on his life, and he says, whatever was my profit, and that's all things that he thought mattered to him, all the things that he thought were important and that benefited him, whatever was to my profit, I now consider it lost for the sake of Christ, and what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Compared to knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. But then he talks about those things that he thought were important. He said, I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ. And oh dear. A translation for the word rubbish is dung or worse. This is kids TV, folks. We're going to stay with dung. All those things that made him who he was, before he met Christ, he now considers rubbish or dung. Wow. So I'm asking you and I'm asking me, I'm asking myself as much, what area of your life are you dissatisfied do you have a spirit of ungratefulness and you can't see God's goodness in your own life? Do you find yourself always comparing yourself, your house, your car, your job, your money, your looks with others, and you always seem to come up short? 
Are you consumed by the consumerism that our culture is saturated in? Always wanting more, more stuff. You need more. Do you blame God for where you're at and feel that you deserve so much more? You know, the things of this world will never satisfy. And why? Why? Because our deepest need is not a physical need. Oh, we do have physical needs. We talked about that earlier at the top of the message, you know, that we need food and clothing, and in this weather, to be able to eat and live indoors. Absolutely, those are needs. But those are things that God promises he'll provide, and we don't need to be chasing after them. But our deepest need is spiritual, because sin has separated us from God. And I believe that in order for us to experience that peace and contentment in this life is to come to a deeper understanding of just how far gone we are apart from Christ. It says that we were dead in our sins. Dead. Can a dead thing revive itself? The answer is, can a dead thing revive itself? No. Can a dead thing bring itself back to life? No, it takes something outside of it to bring it back to life. This is what God has done for us. He is so rich in mercy and he loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And through the death and resurrection of Jesus, he has given us life. He has given us life. We are alive because of what Christ has done for us. And like Paul says, everything else is nothing compared to knowing Christ. And if the theme song to your life is, I can't get no satisfaction, then get to know Jesus. Get to know Christ. And when we know him, we'll have a worldview change. We'll begin to value what he values. We'll see that if we're in Christ, we have all that we need. We'll be looking at our stuff differently. We'll be looking at ourselves differently. We'll be looking at our relationships differently. We'll be looking at the world differently. As those values start to to grow and develop in our lives as Christ moves into our lives. And then we will see that when we are in Christ, we have all that we need. He is more than enough. Will you pray with me? Lord, how could we doubt your goodness? How could we doubt your love for us? We only have to look at the cross and see how rich in mercy you are and how much you loved us. Father, forgive us. Help us today to pursue the things that matter to you. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit who will give us the power we need to overcome the attitude that what the world offers is better than what you offer. And God, by the power of your Spirit, break all the lies that we wrongly believe. And may the truth of your son, Jesus, set us free. We count it all a loss that we might gain your son, Jesus. And then when we do, may we discover that not only is he enough, but he is way more than enough. And I thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.